Amen. Thank you, brother, sisters. Appreciate your hard work. We're in Genesis chapter 29, I mean 49, and if you want to open up your Bible, there's a pew Bible also if you want to follow along. We'll do some scripture reading before we look at that, and it's on page 43 in that pew Bible right in front of you there. Uh, And we'll begin at verse 28 and read through 33. Please follow along as I read. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, He drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Let's pray. Lord, to die well. God, give us insight into how you view this. It says in your word, precious in your sight is the death of your saints. And so I ask you, God, that We would rejoice in what we have. Uh, We would understand a little more fully of how blessed we are and uh, to have a proper death theology. Uh, Thank you, God. And thank you that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So thank you for all this, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible doesn't spend a lot of time talking about funerals. Um, You'll see uh, Jesus showing up at what is started as one, and then he'll save the day, and somebody will be alive again. Uh, I think the longest he waited was the the time when he had heard that Lazarus is sick, and then Lazarus dies, and he waits a little more longer, and then he starts making his way um, toward Bethany, and then ultimately raises him from the dead. Uh, in In the book of Acts, there is this lady named Tabitha that dies. And by the way, does anybody know what Tabitha's other name was in the word? Dorcas. Dorcas is the other name for Tabitha. And so it's one of those things where I'm I'm thinking, if I was Tabitha, I would have gone, we're fine with Tabitha. We don't even have to give them that information, okay? But that's what God does. And, And But at a certain point in the story, she dies... And she is surrounded by all of these people that are, uh, that she's ministered to, and they've brought in all these garments that she made for them, and uh, it's like they're weeping into these garments that she has made. And so her, and then ultimately Peter comes and saves the day again. Um, But... What she did, what she invested in the lives of these people is what was remembered. And there was mourning, but ultimately it led to, I think, something positive because it was like, boy, this lady did all this stuff for us. Look at, look at this. I mean, what this represents. We're going to mourn. We're going to grieve, but not like those who have no hope. And so I have hope. And so I've thought about that, this, and th- this will be this week, talking about when he dies and then his burial um, we'll talk about that next week. So you're like, ooh, this is exciting. Good death talks. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Um, but, but, he's, but he's got it in the word for a reason. He wants us to see how we as believers should die. Uh, and, and do you think about that? Do you think about yourself with that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the end run. I'm on... You know, like guys my age, they start, you know, unbuttoning their shirt to about here. They've got the, 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 the bling. They, they, um, they've got the Corvette, the, the, um, 
the, the convertible, and they're calling that a midlife crisis. Now, that's true. I'm going to 106, all right? So it isn't a midlife crisis. A midlife crisis should hit around, in our time, around 35, 36, but don't think about it. If there's somebody sitting here going, hey, I'm around that age. <laughs> don't, all right? I'm going to play the lottery. Let's see what happens, all right? Um, but have you thought about that in the area of, like, I've even told Kim, like, if I die, if I were to die today, I'd want to be buried in Warrington. Um, and she may move away, get remarried. I, I don't know how that all plays out. But those are the kind of things that go through my mind as I'm, um, we've even had the d- discussion, like, would you remarry? Would, you know, how that would be, you know? You know, I would be watching from a cloud, you know? Um, I said, have at it, you know? Um, but those are kind of the kind of talks that I think to be realistic um, I don't ne- think I've ever sat down with her and said, and here's the songs I'd like sung at my funeral. Here's the passage of scripture. Who, here's who I'd want to do this, who, to officiate at that. Um, but those aren't a bad conversations to have. Not that you're, and don't, but don't make it like weird. Like, are you thinking about, <laughs> like, should I up the insurance? No. Um, but honestly, it's that kind of thing where it's to be, because that's so helpful. I, I know that when my, father-in-law passed away and it was so so loving of him he had now he handled the finances in the home but he had a file on what to do in case he died passwords you know know what i'm saying uh the different things that that so she could have that she could sit down with kim and her two sisters and say this is what daddy has done and and to help the process along. That to me is loving. To look at, at ourselves and going, I'm in, I'm in the end run of this thing. And the most loving thing to do is to, to be honest about it, to, to address it. But also, and this is my encouragement to all of us here, let's work on finishing well. I mean, come on, we're this close to the end, and then I decide... I'm running, I'm doing the marathon, I'm running, running, and then finally I just go sit on the lawn. And it's basically a relay. I mean, God's called me to pass a baton on, you know, faithful men to teach others also. But I don't, you know, I go up to, hey, we're part of a team, what's the deal? I just didn't feel like running anymore. Or I felt like going off. Instead of going, no, I'm going to stick to the stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be what I should be. I mean, you, you, you do the pastor thing long enough, you see different people and how they handle these kind of things. You find out that the spouse that dies, they were the spiritual one. They die, and then there's one that just kicks it up a notch, and you see, wow, they had it in. And they, there's a line that says, you find out what people are full of, what something is full of when it gets hit. Because that's what comes out. And so I've seen the couple where the one goes on, the one dies, and the one goes on, and you're like, wow, they, they, they were both into this thing called Christ. They, they, and they just keep going on. Not that they're happy and they're rejoicing, but they love the Lord and they're serving the Lord. And then there's the one that, that one dies, and you don't see them again. They're not doing church because it was never in them. They did it because they were married to this person. Oh, Lord. And so when we look at a passage of scripture like this, we go, Father, help me to live well and die well. And if that seems morbid to you, it's just being honest. Because this is a man who got it. Who, let's face it, he was a piece of work. Early on, just from the get-go, he's, gra- he's tripping up his brother coming out of the womb. He's that kind of kid. You want to slap him. His name, he's named Jacob, which means supplanter, trickster, stealer, the one who grabs the ankle. 
Those guys will freak you out. We played, we played murder in the house around here, downstairs. So that's where all the lights are off. Everybody's walking around, scared, screaming. And it's just priceless to watch somebody crouch down next to the water fountain, somebody walking by, and somebody just grabbing their ankle. I'm telling you, there are some quality noises that come out of some women. <laughs> the one who grabs the ankle. That's Jacob. You're Jacob! Jacob! And so we look at this and, and, and we see something. So let's, let's, let's learn. Let's read and learn. Point number one, look at the last words. If you want to take notes, there's a section in bulletin to do that. Look at the last words. Look at verse 28 again with me. All these, now remember we just got done with the whole blessings and all, sometimes cursings of the brothers. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. It's interesting, at this point, when Moses writes this, they all know this. It's their 12 tribes. To, to Jacob and all them growing up, they're 12 boys that he's been dealing with. But these are 12 groups of people that, remember we saw on our map, allotments of land that ultimately, that, but it's a family. 12 tribes of Israel this is what their father said to them. And look at, this, look at this word that shows up three times in three different ways. Um, this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. Three times the word bless is used there, or a form of it. And look at what he does. It says, each blessing was suitable to Another translation would be, would be appropriate to them. And it, by the way, isn't that so good? Isn't that, isn't that a guy who knows his kids? This is so important. I'll meet these guys, these hardcore guys. I was fair with my kids. They always do it in that accent. I was fair with my kids. And I did it in such a way that I treated them all the same. And I'm thinking, dude, you really didn't think about it. Because they're all different, aren't they? I mean... I've watched coaches over the years. Good coaches coach different kids differently. They know this will work with this kid, but if I do this with this kid, oh, I start I'm getting this one kid's face, and I'm screaming at them on top of the vein, and I'm just screaming. They're the ones, I love it. I'll go through a wall for you, coach. The other one, <laughs> Then other ones, if you're too soft with them, they don't think you're serious. Now that's not even talking about parenting. That's just coaching. Talk about parenting. And I know there's times when, and kids, you've got to give it to us on this one. This one I know is hard because while you're watching it, you're going, you, you treat her so different than me. She always gets away with stuff. And she might. But it might also mean that um, she actually gets it after a look. She actually gets it after two words are said, and she's broken. She's such a goody-goody. She's your favorite. I've shared this before. I've got one of my children thinks that we've got a list of who's favorite. They got it all figured out. All right. They're all our favorites. Amen. Amen. But I love this here, that he goes, he's just honest, he goes, their father said to them as he blessed them, and every kid needed a blessing, every one of them. We need to speak this, and don't wait till your dying days. Speak blessing into live, lives. Tell, catch them doing good stuff. I had recently, I was telling this in the Sunday school class, I'm not going to go to the fullest extent of it, but I was able to talk to somebody this week. They had texted me uh, a question about something concerning a certain kind of sin that is going on, okay, a certain kind of lifestyle that's going on. And they said, do you believe this? And I said, well, let's talk about the gospel first. Let's talk about you. And I was able to take that bridge and, and share the gospel with this individual. 
And I said, now let me answer your question. And by the way, I'm keeping those two, two things se separate. Their salvation, the gospel. I'm keeping that separate from this next talk. And this next talk is one where I look him right in the eye and I say, okay, I'll answer that question. I go to the Old Testament, I go to the New Testament, I address this. But let's talk about some other sins. Let's talk about lust and let's talk about adultery and let's talk about fornication and that brings me to you because he's living with his girlfriend and they had a little baby and he hasn't married her yet and so he can look at this over here and go i don't like this and so i want you to t give me bible verses that back me up in my thinking and concern that stuff and great i'll tell you that that's fine but let's talk about our sin and then let's talk about your sin And I'll talk to friends, and they'll go, man, how do you do that with people? And you don't realize, here's the thing, I don't have that talk every time. That's like one time I have that talk, but I've had five, ten other talks where I am affirming, I'm affirming, I'm affirming. But at some point, out of love, love speaks the truth. Because if I love somebody, I'll tell them the truth. And I, I'm surrounded by a bunch of people that claim Christianity that won't, out of love, say, I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth concerning this. Oh, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. Okay. I don't know how much you love them. It's not like I wake up every morning, hey, I love to have these. I don't. But what kind of relationship is that? And so I see here, you saw him, how he talked to Reuben. You were a boy. You were, you were my guy. You were my boy. But you were out of control. You were like floodwaters. And we've seen what happens with that. Out of control. So he's speaking the truth into their lives. Levi, Simeon, you were angry. Levi, though, you're, you're repentant of it. You, you have changed. I am going to allow you to be a priest. I'm blessing you in that way. You are going to be a blessing, not to just one allotment of land. I'm going, to, I'm going to spread you out so that you can be a blessing to all these different, to all of your brother's family. And then Judah, you are going to ultimately get the blessing so much so that we sing a song. Talking about the roar. Because out of you, even though you are a piece of work too, God's Son is going to come to save the earth. That's the Lion of Judah. That's his nickname. So each blessing was suitable. Each blessing was appropriate. Let us be people that do that with people so that Every time they, we come their way, and by the way, after I got done talking to this young man, I said, he had that look in his eye, like a deer in the headlights, and I just said to him, I go, I'm sorry if I came across too hard. And he looked at me, he goes, no, no, no. I love when you talk to me like this. You're the only one that tells me the truth. Wow. And I love him. I'm telling you, I pray God's blessing on his life. I want, I want his life to be lived to the fullest. So look at the last words. Don't wait to the last hours. Invest, love, speak. That's point number two. Look at the last will. Look at the last will. He gives some burial instructions. Verse 29. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite. So he's in, ta in, an in anticipation of his death. He elaborates on his initial burial, burial instructions that he had gave earlier to Joseph. This word, gathered to my people. Family is important. He sees that as something important. Do you, do you realize that when we look at the, um, the Old Testament saint, what that looked like? His, his death, burial, and um, what happens to him... Uh, at the moment of death was different than ours. And I don't know what this, how this played out completely, but I got to go with the parable of Jesus with Lazarus and the rich man. And it says when Lazarus died, he was taken to Abraham's bosom. So there was this place, um, this, this 
place of paradise. And, and what's weird about it is that they could see across a chasm, it said, where he could see people in torment. And it was like they went to this place, Abraham's bosom, Abraham's this place, and they would go there. And the Bible says this all changed when Jesus dies and he leads captivity captive and he takes those to be with the Lord. Now, I'm just going with what the, the scriptures tell me on that. And so he's thinking, talking about Jacob, he's going to die and ultimately go to see granddad to be gathered to his people. But for us as believers, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's our hope. And we grieve like those, we grieve, but not like those who have no hope. Okay? So let's keep going. Verses 30 through 32. In the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a bearing place. By the way, Abraham was rich, like really rich. And this is the only thing he bought and owned in all the Bible. And it was a burial plot. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And look at this. And there I buried Leah. So this isn't where Rachel's buried. Rachel's buried, remember, when uh, Benjamin in childbirth, she dies, she's buried in Bethlehem, around Bethlehem. And this was not the wife that he was like really, really in love with. But this is where he wants to be buried. Verse 32, the field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. So he's getting across the point that this, this, is, where I, this is where I want to be brought. He tells them how this came about. This, this arrangement that was set up by Abraham, it was bought from Hittites, and it wasn't through conquest or being a squatter. Honor was finally given to Leah in death and in Jacob's request to be buried alongside his wife, as were his father's burial alongside Rachel, the beloved wife's wife, was not requested. And so that he's, he's, he's making it very plain and clear. I said this stuff to, to Joseph, and now I'm telling it to all of you guys. This is what, when I came, when I came to Egypt, when I came here, I, I held you guys to this. I want to be buried here, talking about Canaan, because this is a testimony. Me being buried here is a testimony of what God has promised. And I'm telling you, as 400 years or however it goes by, and people would walk by and they go, yeah, there's some guy buried there. And these people actually believed that they own this land. And, and, and for years, it probably was mocked. Yeah, these bunch of people showed up from Egypt, and there's this big fanfare that we'll look at next week. And, but really, nothing's come of it. In fact, what I've heard, they're down there right now. They're building pyramids. And they're building them, not at, like they want to build them. They're in slavery. But God. And that's the testimony of our death. That we believe. We believe in this person, Jesus, and what he's done. Last point. Point number three. Look at the last witness. Verse 33. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet. And it's like he's sitting on the side of the bed. It's such, such a picture. He's sitting on the side of the bed. He's talking to them. He's laid his hand on them. He's talked to them. And he just, just the love and things along that line. And when he's done, he just lays down and pulls up his feet. That sounds so comfortable to me. Drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This is a sweet benediction. Um, drew up his feet breathed his last, gathered to his people. What a great picture. You know, as you and I look at this, um, why, why does Jacob get so much recognition? I know for a while we've been dealing with Joseph. I, I understand that. But we're, his, Jacob's still been around. He's been alive. And, and he still shows up. And he's showing up at these last two chapters here. Why does he get so much? And, I, and I'll tell you why. And this, this comes back to 
what we believe here. Why would we even preach through the Old Testament? Why would they? Because the gospel keeps showing up. Jesus keeps showing up. Um, why is Jacob important? Because Jesus is important. And so if you miss anything here, this, he keeps coming up in stories. It ultimately, it's like, I don't know, yesterday if you went to fireworks. Did anybody go to fireworks? Um, you ever, you, you know when the finale is going to be coming. You know that. I mean, you can just sense it. I, I, I always kind of have this thing that I always start. I always start singing Love American Style when, the, when the, the fireworks are going on. If you don't know, look up Love American Style. What an amazing show, okay? But there's fireworks and Love American Style. And Kim just hits me, and I just love it because I'm weird. Um, but so these fireworks are going on, and at a certain point, you know the ultimate firework that's going to show up. Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Boom. Numbers 24.17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Boom. 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Who shall come from your body? And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Boom. Matthew 2, verse 6. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Boom. Hebrews 8, 1, 8. But... Of the Son, he says, I love this. This is God talking, by the way. He says, your throne, O God. So God is calling Jesus God. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness, uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And then Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. That's nothing new, by the way. That Westerns have stolen this. All right. We know the hero is here. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Boom! And then everybody knows... We're done. We go home now. That is a display. That's power. And it's throughout our scriptures. So why we work through Genesis is because we're looking at Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of the gospel. Thank you for this display of power. Thank you for how bright it is, for how loud it is, for how honest it is. And we are mesmerized by the beauty of it. So, Lord, we ask you now that as we're spending this time together, that we would allow the truth of your word as this daddy who's blessed and now has died, gathered to his people, that, God, we would take you seriously, that we would not wait to the last days to share love and blessing to people, but we would also be people that um, receive it and be willing to grab the baton, that we would be faithful men and women also 
and we keep running the race because we're not done yet. We're not done until we see you face to face. Thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.